Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Um, for the past few weeks, we've been going through a series called Nourish. Uh, we've talked about how the scriptures nourish us. We've talked about how we can be nourished through prayer. And now we're heading into the last segment for March. We're going to talk about fasting as a kind of nourishment. And I want to begin today by asking, what are you hungry for? Is it lunch? Or something deeper? Maybe it's something deeper and more profound, like for COVID to be over, to be close to your families again. Um, maybe you're here today and you're hungry for the word of God. As I've been going through the book of Romans with the young adults, um, one, of my, one of my practical points of discipleship for myself that I drew out of the book was uh, to be grateful for the way that God's body, the church, uh, can kind of carry me and teach me and invite me into God's presence. And this reminds me of a, a poem by Hazel Hall, um, where she writes, not until the hunger of all the world was blown like a wind against my window could I name my own. And Hazel reminds us that hunger is something that we feel in relationship to others as the hunger of all the world allows her to name her own. Now it's been in discussion with the young adults and some other believers that I've come to realize um, that my anger uh, is an emotion that I feel is a window into my desire. And as a disciple of Jesus, I have oftentimes fled my anger, having believed the lie that if I want to be a follower of Jesus, I have to hang my humanity up at the door. I think it's very common for us to flee from our hunger. Uh, in ancient antiquity, it was very common to feel hunger. Today, rather than feeling that together and exploring that together, I think our natural impulse is to run away from our hunger. Hunger is something that alerts us to our needs. It's painful, but rightfully so. It urges us towards what we need, towards nourishment. However, it's still far easier to avoid this than it is to be thankful for it and to pay attention to it properly. Today, hunger is a monster to be defeated with raw cookie dough and Doritos rather than with patience. But I'm not really talking about physical hunger as much as I am talking about spiritual hunger, which is a mirror for our physical hunger. It alerts us to a need. Many of us here today have been longing to see the Lord at work in our midst, to feel his presence here. But this raises all sorts of uncomfortable questions. This hunger that I feel, does this mean that God's not present? Does this indicate some kind of lack? Should we be alarmed by our hunger as if it suggests some kind of absence? So rather than responding to our spiritual hunger with attentiveness and awareness, it's very tempting to stick our heads in the sand. It's very easy to mask our hunger than to reckon with it. And sometimes the uncomfortable realities that it points us towards. Yet, as followers of Jesus, we are a hungering people. We're taught in the scriptures that we are meant to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to hunger for manna from heaven, and to hunger for the word of God. As disciples of Jesus, we are a hungering people. And one of the ways that we express and attune to this hunger is through fasting. Fasting is when we hunger so deeply for God's presence in our lives that we wish to say it not just with our hearts, but with the rest of our bodies as well. 
And this is why we don't eat when we're fasting. Or even we refrain from other consumable goods like media or materials. But why would we fast? Why would we respond to hunger if, if we're already lacking? I want to kind of explore this today. Um, Scott McKnight is a brilliant New Testament scholar who wrote a helpful book on fasting. He says this about fasting. Fasting is a natural, inevitable response to a grievously sacred, sacred moment. Or I, I think I'll probably refer to it more as fasting is a natural, inevitable response to our hungry moments, to the moments when we're hungry for God. Um, I also want to point out with this statement that fasting is not a tool to resolve our hunger. It's not a tool to accomplish some kind of goal. It is a response to God. It is a response to our desire for God. So the story of Matthew 11, 15 to 19, which is what we're going to kind of root down today, addresses the abuse of fasting as a means to an end. Uh, John the Baptist disciples have just interrogated Jesus about why he doesn't fast, while John the Baptist was an avid faster. This caused John the Baptist followers to question if Jesus was really the Messiah that John had predicted would come. So in verse 15, Jesus says, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now this is a phrase that's repeated all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, uh, and it's a literary signpost that alerts us to the fact that Jesus is about to reveal something about who God is uh, and who Jesus is. The phrase is an invitation to listen with faith. And it's, what's more is it's meant to do for our ears what the aroma of a home-cooked meal is meant to do for our bellies. Uh, it's, it's like how a call to dinner beckons us forward, both body and soul. This phrase is meant to beckon us likewise to the words of Jesus. It stirs our hunger and arouses a desire for nourishment. And with these words, we can begin to imagine how hunger is an invitation to fasting rather than a call to end our hunger. Listening and fasting are both disciplines of anticipation. So Jesus continues in verse 16, To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. Verse 17, we played a pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. So what's happening here is that Jesus is telling a story about this child in the marketplace who just wants everyone to play his game. Uh, he wants them all to dance to his song. And then... When the tempo chain changes and another song is sung, uh, the, the, the children who's playing complains when the kids don't just leap into this new, new song and, and do what he wants. This child represents the crowd when they complain that John fasted and Jesus didn't earlier in the chapter. This generation wants to call the shots about what it means to follow God. When I was a kid, I wanted to call the shots too. Uh, I loved playing Batman as a kid. And, and whenever, I, whenever I played with other kids, we would play Batman. And gosh darn it, I was going to be Batman. I, I, I gave the other kids a choice. Like, they could be the Joker or the Riddler, but they were always going to be the bad guy, and I was going to be the good guy. When you're a kid, I think this kind of attitude is normal. <laughs> but as an adult, it's childish. And this is the, an insult in Jesus' poem. He compares the disciples who reject him to the children who are fixated on getting what they want. What they want, how they want. Uh, we see the same problem crop up all throughout the Gospels, all throughout the stories of Jesus. Um, Jesus is not the kind of Messiah that the Jewish people expected. They expected a warrior king, someone to come in and to give the Romans the boot, to lead them back to glory. They were hungry for this kind of kingdom of God to be restored. So when Jesus comes along and he starts preaching all this stuff about peace and loving your neighbor, they're like, we got to kill this guy. 
That's not what we want. So they do. They kill him in order to have their hunger filled their way. Put in other words, following Jesus is a counterintuitive response to God, desiring God's kingdom. Just like fasting is a counterintuitive response to hunger. The reason being, these responses seem to endorse the pain that we feel in our hunger rather than trying to extinguish it. Uh, it's, it's all too easy to try and escape our hunger with, with cheap fixes, spiritual junk food. Jesus flushes this out in the next couple of verses. Verse 18, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and he said, and they said, he has a demon. 19, and the son of man came eating and drinking. And they said, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus comes and he finds the crowds insatiable. Not because they're not being fed, not because they don't have a Messiah who's come to them, but because they're picky eaters. They refuse everything that's offered to them, like the kids sitting at the dinner table who just won't eat their broccoli. They want to be full, but it has to be ice cream. They want God, but it has to be like King David. Go kill some Philistines. They're more concerned with escaping the hunger that they have than responding to it appropriately. These people are not satisfied to play drinking games with Jesus unless they get to call all the shots. And their anxiety about God's kingdom seeps through their pores as they throttle Jesus. Not this way. This isn't how I want my hunger answered. God can be God as long as he doesn't touch what we want in the way that we want it. And so Jesus says, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Had this generation been watching with hope? Had they been paying attention to what they hungered for and, and ready to receive what they needed rather than what they wanted? Had they not been trying to escape their hunger, they would have seen the fulfillment of their hope in Jesus. Instead, they just saw the ways that Jesus didn't fit them. So when we avoid fasting as a natural, inevitable response to our hunger for God, we avoid meeting Jesus wherever he is, as he is. Jesus is just as much with us in our hunger as he is with us in our fullness. And so these are both essential in order to follow Jesus. Um, I'm in this, uh, this discipleship group, and uh, we're working through this program. And one of the axioms of the program is Jesus meets us in reality. He doesn't want us to escape reality to be with him. He wants to meet us right here where we're at, where we're hungry, what we hunger for. So part of the reason that it bothered the crowds that Jesus didn't fast was because it was very traditional for Jewish people to fast twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday. Fasting was an essential part of the Jewish spiritual landscape so much so that Jesus not fasting caused people's heads to turn. It's kind of like if I lived in Edmonton, but instead of rooting for the Oilers, I supported a team that actually won once in a while. <laughs> you guys know, you guys know. Um, but like, have I been an Edmontonian if I haven't participated in our common suffering together? Or, or maybe put another way, imagine being an Edmontonian but never bearing the cold, never waiting through a bitter winter and thirsting for the warmth of summer. Have you really been an Edmontonian if you haven't known that hunger? And so fasting was a serious part of what it meant to be a Jew. Fasting meant that you had skin in the game. You hungered for God and stood in solidarity with your people's hunger too. So it can seem like at first glance, Jesus isn't about this hunger thing. But Jesus was God in the flesh. So it was all the more reason for Jesus not to, flash, not to fast. You, we don't long for summer when the sun is kissing our skin and the grass 
is enveloping our feet. So the disciples of Jesus were far too busy enjoying the reality, the flesh and blood reality of God and the flesh with them, uh, to fast. Fast forward to today. Has fasting made it into our common life together? Do we fast as a church? At first, I was thinking, no, no, we've never done that. But as I started to chew it over, I realized, yeah, yeah, we do, in innumerable ways. Most notably, we have fasted for long, lonely months from each other's presence. See, the church has been sequestered to televisions and small gatherings in a way that's left us feeling suffocated. Many churches have closed their doors alongside small businesses and even homes. And we've felt the weight of this as we strive to pursue Jesus during these dark days where our appetite for solitude has been quenched many times over. Right now, fasting from one another's presence is a natural, inevitable response to what we love. We love each other. We want to be in each other's presence, and that's the entire reason that we don't. So as we find ourselves in the midst of the season of Lent, we haven't really talked about that. It's Lent right now. This is a season in the church calendar when, when we revisit Jesus' road to Jerusalem, where he's eventually crucified. And traditionally, the church marks this season by fasting. Um... As we find ourselves in the midst of this season, we might have approached it asking, what else am I going to give up? Um, Ed Stetzer, the editor of Christianity Today magazine, uh, he tweeted last year, I hadn't planned on giving up quite this much for Lent. And that was at the beginning of COVID. Um, just a few months, a few weeks ago, he, he retweeted that. And he was like, again? And so there's a sense in which we had so much taken for us, from us. We have so much lack. How can we surrender even more than what's been taken from us? What I want to suggest today is that when we feel like, like God's left us with this hunger for his kingdom, for, uh, this hunger for him to change the world, these are the times when fasting is the most appropriate Loss and heartbreak are precisely the times that call for fasting. Fasting is for responding to pandemics and death, the loss of jobs, separation from family, and division between old friends. Fasting is an especially appropriate response to our hunger for God and his kingdom. Fasting is a correct response to this desire to see the world set right. It's a way of working the weariness of our days and our need for God's salvation into our bones and sinew. And so fasting is an inevitable response of a person to our hunger for God's presence and action in our world. It is not, however, a means to achieve our own ends. Too often, I think spiritual disciplines are sold to us as high-performance habits that will help us achieve our dreams. Um, Yeah, fasting is, is like one of the weirdest spiritual disciplines because like you don't, you don't necessarily get anything out of it. You give so much of yourself in fasting. Um, I often hear about how it's good for your health, um, but the fact is, after a few days, no, not really. Uh, it, it can actually be quite bad for you. Um, fasting uh, is a Christian discipline, though, because it so essentially points to something beyond just our health and just our life right now. And this is the beauty of fasting. Fasting is a discipline of hope and anticipation. Fasting points us towards a resurrection. Fasting points us beyond the here and now. 
And so it's not going to help you achieve all of your goals in this life, not if you're doing it as a Christian. Fasting is about looking forward to resurrection. It's about looking forward to God's kingdom come. Even though it does have some benefits, fasting for short periods of time can uh, be very good for you. But when the biblical authors talk about fasting, it's about more. It's about deeper things than bread and, and, and your daily food. It's being said, sometimes when we look at fasting in the Bible, it can appear as if the promise for fasting is a blessing. So if we just look at Isaiah 58, um, verses 9 to 12, this is a really good example. It says, Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. So I've just read this section right here. This is, if you fast and do justly, which in the Jewish mind was completely interlinked. They would oftentimes fast and donate the money they saved from not eating to the poor. So fasting was really tightly connected with justice. If you do this, and what follows is this list of blessings that... Uh, it's, really, it's a really gorgeous list of, of good things. It says, Then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins, and they will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets and dwellings. Now it's clear why, why somebody might read this and think, oh yeah, if I fast, I get all this great stuff. Why wouldn't I do that? In fact, the early church fathers from antiquity who, who uh, were followers of Jesus shortly after the apostles all died out, they were... They, they commonly believed that unless you fast, you cannot have a cr close relationship with God. But I think something less transactional might become, be happening here. Could it be that this is a cycle? For all we taste and see of God's goodness, it only creates a hunger for more. And hunger is a sign of spiritual growth rather than malnourishment, rather than lack. It's a sign of a right desire. Hunger isn't something to be escaped. It's directing us to Jesus. Put in other words, as we're filled, we realize we are still empty and in need of more. When we understand fasting as a means to achieve spiritual growth rather than as a response to God, it becomes really utilitarian. It's like imagining that your spouse is a means to temper your sexuality or that your house is, your home is, is just a means to a bigger home or, or a stepping stone to buying a bigger house. Our spiritual disciplines are sapped of their power when we objectify them, when we use them as a means to our own ends. Fasting is not a means to an end. It is a worshipful, worshipful response to our hunger for God. Fasting is the cry of a heart that has tasted God's goodness and demands more. It's not a way to eradicate our hunger. Objectification is easily something that we do not only to fasting, but to the location of our fasting also, our bodies. Our bodies are meant for worship. And when we look to them to achieve other ends, we can destroy what God has given us through gross misuse. Anorexia is a desperate attempt to achieve love through starvation which is a dark parody of fasting. Overwork is the same. 
over-exercising is the same. We have this right hunger for a good thing that we've been deprived of. And so we use our bodies to achieve it. Meanwhile, God's table is set before us. God's table is set before you. The early church fathers also often practiced a form of spiritual anorexia. They would eat, they would not eat for lingering days because they believed that their bodies were an evil to be escaped. It's so easy for us to abuse our bodies with fasting without the gospel of Jesus to guide it. And so the gospel of Jesus in the story is that Jesus ate and drank. Jesus eating and drinking offers us a helpful correction if we believe that our bodies are something to escape or beat down. Jesus is equally with us in eating as he is in fasting. The kingdom of God is proclaimed by Jesus and his partying, as well as John and his fasting. The good news of Jesus for us seems to be that his wisdom reveals itself through both of these things. God did not come to us in some kind of inhuman extreme. He didn't come to us on magazine covers or at the bottom of ice cream tubs. He came to us in flesh and blood to stain the page of his, pages of history and with life that dwells at the bottom of a grave. As Christians, our bodies are resurrected into a new story that speaks of a beauty and a goodness, even as we navigate hunger pangs. Part of this gospel, part of the goodness of this, this Jesus that we meet in today's story, is that the pain of hunger isn't bad. It's actually directing us to what we ought to desire. And so we're liberated from treating our bodies as either sex objects or food receptacles. The Christian body is more like the iconography we see in a stained glass window. It points towards a deeper and more mysterious reality than silver screens or Instagram advertisements ever could. And this is the part, a part of the new life that we are resurrected into as born again, baptized members of Jesus' body. Fasting is not the means to how we achieve this image bearing, we already bear this through Jesus. Fasting does not trigger fulfillment with God. It's a response to God that appropriately acknowledges our hunger for him and draws us towards him. Fasting is about being drawn towards God by our, our hunger and not escaping it. Fasting is about being drawn to God in your hunger rather than escaping it. But it's very easy to treat fasting like a tool. I've done it. I've padded the reasons that I fast with all sorts of things. It's good for me. It'll get rid of my, my bloating. Um, fasting will help me become a mature Christian. Um, but this is, this is mercenary. This is kind of like when psychologists say, you know, relationships healthy relationships are really good for you because if you have a healthy relationship, you live longer. I mean, like, yeah, but like, how, how romantic is that? Like, um, I was, I was joking with the last sermon, sir, uh, in last service that I would give Ray Lynn a, a Valentine's day card next year. And it would just say, um, happy Valentine's day. I'm only with you cause I want to live past 60. So romantic, right? It misses the point. It misses the entire point. I'm with Raylan because I love her, not because I want to live past 60. And when we fast and we use it as a tool to achieve an end, we do the same thing. We miss the point. We miss God. And so wisdom is proved right by her deeds in Jesus' words by a reorientation of our fasting. Fasting is not a tool we use to accomplish our spiritual and personal goals. 
Fasting is a natural, inevitable response to our hunger for God. Fasting is a natural response to God that beckons for Him to fill us in a way that food just can't. Fasting is a story of a bride who longs for her groom so much that she can't bear to eat for her anticipation of his arrival. In our story from Matthew 11 today, Jesus criticizes this generation because they failed to look for God's kingdom with faith. They're trying to escape their pain and their hunger. They wanted it filled their way. They were consumed with getting what they wanted, when they wanted. Kind of like that child playing the flute in the marketplace and getting upset when people didn't dance to his song. The good news of the story that Jesus offers us is liberation from the tyranny of our desires. We are no longer bound to live out of our flesh in slavery to the whims of the world. Instead, we're invited to something more. We're invited to a place where we can actually sit with our pain, listen to it, be drawn to Jesus through the pain. I think some of the other New Testament writers called this picking up our cross. Today, Jesus invites us into the more of discipleship through a feast that we call communion. In Luke 22, 18, Jesus says, For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus is the fulfillment of our fasting. He fasted for three days in the grave, and he rose again. And so now we remember his death and resurrection with this communion feast that tells us God is with us. However, we often kind of skim the hunger part of this. And that's why I want to introduce fasting to us as a church body, uh, as, as, as something we can do to prepare for communion. So one of the main reasons we do communion is because it's recognition that God is present with us. And by fasting, my hope is that we can pay attention to our hunger for God, even just notice that it's there, heading up to communion from now on. And so we're going to invite you to do that. Uh, obviously, it's a little too late today, but coming up to the next one, um, yeah, just consider taking a day off of meals or even just one meal and one day off from eating. And take the time that you would normally eat to just recognize, yeah, I'm, I have this hunger. I have this hunger for something more, something beyond me. And our hope is that, that that reminds us that we need God. And that brings us to a place where we're prepared for communion. We're prepared to seek the presence of God. This isn't something we're going to command. We're not going to enforce this on you. I'm not going to come to your house and knock on the door and be like, are you fasting? <laughs> I see that rule on. Um, but yeah, what this is meant to do is, is to turn our eyes to hope towards God's presence with us now and in the future. So let's give thanks for God's word before we continue into communion. I'm just going to pray, so let's bow our heads. Let us neither ignore our pain, Father, by pretending it's all okay when it isn't, nor coddle and magnify it so that we dull our capacity to enjoy all that remains good in this life. For joy that denies sorrow is neither hard won or true or eternal. It is not real joy at all. Sorrow that refuses to make space for the return of joy and hope in the end, becoming nothing but a temple for the worship of our own wounds. So give us strength, O oh God, to feel our grief deeply, never to hide our hearts from it, and fast as naturally as we shed tears. Amidst the pain that lades these days, give us courage, O oh Lord, Courage to live them fully, to love and allow ourselves to be loved, to remember, celebrate, and honor what was, 
to invest in a hope of what will be, to feast as freely as we breathe. For this is who we are. We are a hungering people. We are a people of the promise, a people shaped in the image of God, whose very being generates all the joy in the universe, yet who weeps and grieves its brokenness. And here, between the tension of those two, between what was and what will be, and the very is of now, let our hearts be surprised, shaped, and warmed and remade by the same joy that forever wells within and radiates from your heart, O God. Amen.